So it's a great pleasure to welcome this evening uh, Christopher Simons, C.E.J. Uh, Simons, I think. That's your official name, is it? Christopher Simons, yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, for a, a poetry reading. And I'll just very briefly um, introduce him. Um, he's in fact married to one of our um, Daiwa scholars, um, and they went out to Japan in 2006, is that right? Um, and have been there ever since and show every sign of staying uh, for quite a long time to come. And uh, Chris has a DPhil from Oxford um, in Wordsworth, and so as a, as a literature specialist he uh, is a romantic, if you like. Um, <laughs> while while uh, in Japan, there's a, there's a huge demand in Japan for stuff on Shakespeare, so he's um, broadened out uh, in that direction as well. He's published on, on Wordsworth, Shakespeare, Yeats, uh, Emily Dickinson and Sylvia Plath. Um, but of course, he also writes his own uh, poetry, uh, which has won prizes uh, in major competitions in the UK, including the Cardiff International Poetry Competition and the Weekdown Competition. So I think on that note, I'll hand straight over. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you all for coming on such a, a lovely evening. I'm sure we could all be sitting out in a, in a pub garden somewhere, but uh, um, thank you for coming to listen uh, this evening. Um, I think most poets are probably introverts. Uh, it takes a lot to get them out of the house. So uh, the positive side of this means that they're especially grateful uh, when people come out to hear them read. So uh, thank you. I think there are some people here from quite far away uh, this evening, as far as Australia, perhaps, or, or uh, I don't know who's from the farthest away. But um, just a few uh, notes in introduction. I'd like to thank uh, Isobar Press and my editor, Paul Rossiter, uh, for working very hard to produce this book. Uh, Paul just missed being here tonight. He's on his way to the UK right now. Uh, he was kind enough to read from the book last night in Tokyo. Of course, I'd also like to thank the uh, Daiwa Anglo-Japanese Foundation for hosting this event and for all the support they've given us, uh, my wife Tina and myself, since 2006. Without the Daiwa Foundation, we would never have moved to Japan and never had a chance to properly experience the richness of Japanese culture. And we feel very happy to call Japan our home now, and we hope that we continue uh, our long relationship with Japan for the rest of our lives. I'm only going to read for about 40 minutes, uh, read and talk, uh, and then we might have a few minutes for questions and discussion, if people like. Uh, for poems from the collection, I will give page numbers if anyone, prefers, if, if anyone is more visual and prefers to read along. Um, and I'll just say a few words about the book. Uh, as some of you know, I was born in Canada uh, to a British father and a Canadian mother, and they had quite traditional British values, sometimes more British than British. And uh, compounding this, this uh, Canadian-British identity, my grandfather spent uh, a good part of his life working in Asia for the World Health Organization. And his house in Vancouver was filled with uh, wonderful objects, uh, paintings and furniture from many countries, including Japan. And I have vivid memories of uh, sitting or lying uh, surrounded by these objects, watching, uh, well, anime, uh, animation like uh, Gachaman and uh, Space Battleship Yamato. Uh, so from childhood, I felt a very strong connection with East Asia. Uh, I spent my postdoctoral year in China, and then we moved to Japan in 2006. So there are a lot of cultures uh, that are, are mixed up in this book. Some of the poems are Canadian poem or British poem or a Japanese poem, uh, but others, as, as the second poem that I'll read tonight, are really quite a hodgepodge of cultures. Yet despite these various cultural influences, one of the most important philosophical points for me about poetry is that it should not focus on self-expression. All art expresses the identity of its creator. I feel that you don't have to go out of your way to put yourself into your work. So I strongly ag agree with Keats that poets are often the most unpoetical people you'll ever meet. Uh, and I also agree, agree with um, that famous saying by Oscar Wilde, the first line of uh, The Portrait of Dorian Gray, uh, which is uh, to reveal art and to conceal the artist is art's aim. 
So, therefore, none of these poems are autobiographical or confessional. There's no consistent identity between the speakers of each poem. I hope that you'll think of them uh, as a series of dramatic monologues. So without further ado, I'll begin with the first poem in the collection, and this is the poem that gives the book its title uh, from a line at the end of the poem. Um, the smell of tatami mats is often one of the first memories of Japan for foreigners who come to live there. And as the note to this poem reads, a tatami is a rush-covered straw mat, uh, the usual traditional floor covering in Japan, about six feet by three feet, and it functions as the standard unit of room measurement. And new tatami have a very particular smell. As someone who grew up on the Canadian prairie, uh, the smell of tatami for me is a double memory. I associate it both with life in Japan and with my childhood in Canada. Tatami. You'll go far, my son, she said among the cows, alfalfa in my hand and the smell of dung. Not one day all this will be yours. They weren't our cows. What was mine was an acre of buckwheat by a river berm, the smell of hay bales after a storm. Twenty years on, and still it's clung. Far gone is right, hush slide of a paper door. Out of Shinjuku's hamstrung hearts, I slip into my own home like a thief. Manitoba from 10,000 miles away has miniaturized to a blind room. A dozen interlocked tatami mats have brooded through a 12-hour summer day and breathed out acres of grassland from the grass that they'd once been. This golden fleece was mown when it was green. Like mine, my mother taught civility and art and a medicine I couldn't understand. Once more, a child in the dark, I reach for her hand. Before the room airs, a lungful of open field, the gift box of meadow grass unribbons its treasure seals, and all for a time's alfalfa and manure. But before I can let the old pasture go to seed, the night breeze stirs, and Manitoba follows my mother's ghost down the apartment stairs. I loosen my tie as if eye to eye with a bull, and one more civil gesture could cost me my life. The next poem uh, is about the Japanese delicacy uni, or sea urchin, and one of my favorite foods, and perhaps one of yours. <clears throat> uh, as with many kinds of sushi, eating it, uh, particularly uni, can be almost a, for lack of a, of a better word, a sexual experience. Mm -hmm. And every time I eat it, I'm reminded that the Greek goddess Aphrodite, or Venus, was also the patron goddess of sea urchins. And this is on page 16 of the book. Uni comes from the sea, as far from Kitharia as this Hokkaido market stall, as far from Knossos as my father's wood axe, my backwater bull, my jokes about prairie oysters, as far from Aphrodite as the diet of runway model and runaway. In the Nishokudan, it nestles down on a bed of blood-red roe, blood-flecked gold doubloons spilt from a purse of veins, the all-knowing salmon's unborn suffering. Roe slick as the clear pearls worn by the goddess when she comes pierced by sea droplets at earlobes and navel, nipple blisters blow dried by the zephyr, flesh paled, blond locked by Botticelli's family friendly spell, her curves rolled flat as damp dough, anodyne to the aphrodisiac 
of the peep show. Before you lift the stippled prize, the golden yoke, the bifurcated mound from its bed of black thorns, before you warm her raw quiver with hungry breath, pray to Cytherean Venus, to Aphrodite, more than love goddess, the goddess of Ica and Uni, as her mosaics at Crete and Paphos show. To taste it is to know the flesh of gods, sublime profanity, to forget the prairies, my jokes about prairie oysters, my father's wood axe, my backwater bull, and for a moment shiver and shrink like old Uranus at the chill of Saturn's slate black sickle against his balls. I write a lot about wildlife, uh, animals and plants, and many of the poets I admire have written a lot about these subjects. Uh, Wordsworth, Ted Hughes, Marianne Moore, and Basho, of course. Uh, all poems about animals anthropomorphize them to some extent. That is, the poem reads the animal as a human being, or a kind of human being. Sometimes I resist this tendency, as Marianne Moore did very well, but this next poem embraces it. And the poem is Moray, which is on page 30 of the book. Moray. Murderous granny, long in the two teeth that remain, scalp blue rinsed to mottled green, hides under the stairs with a cloudy eye, upturned to the shallows mirror sky, tripping and tucking her victims away to soften and sweeten to tinned pate. All pretense strips off with the old lace, a narrow skull, a vacant face, eyebrows plucked out, ears lopped off, emphysema silent water cough, jaw hanging limp from a goitered neck, and a tongue too short to lick caved in lips, parched and pursed by salt. When she grips your flipper in her death grip, somehow you know this is all your fault. I'm going to do something uh, in this reading that I don't think most poets do, which is to combine reading their own work with poems by great poets who have influenced their development. This is a risk because, of course, or not a risk, it's certain that your own work ends up sounding weak in comparison. Uh, but I want to give you a sense of how these poems grew out of the work that influenced me. Some of the poems in the book are direct homages to, or versions of, work that I admire. But in the case of the next poem, I'm responding to the work of a poet who I admire greatly, but in a more critical way. First, I'll read the poem Pink Dog by the American poet Elizabeth Bishop, and then I'll read my own poem by the same title. This poem, uh, Bush Bishop's poem, takes place in Rio de Janeiro, where Bishop lived for many years, and it should quickly become clear that this is a very light-hearted poem, uh, perhaps inappropriately so, and written, perhaps suitably for a poem about a dog, in a kind of doggerel. Pink Dog by Elizabeth Bishop. The sun is blazing and the sky is blue. Umbrellas clothe the beach in every hue. Naked, you trot across the avenue. Oh, never have I seen a dog so bare, naked and pink, without a single hair. Startled, the passerbys draw back and stare. Of course, they're mortally afraid of rabies. You are not mad, you have a case of scabies, but look intelligent. Where are your babies? A nursing mother by those hanging teats. In what slum have you hidden them, poor bitch, while you go begging, living by your wits? 
Didn't you know it's been in all the papers to solve this problem, how they deal with beggars? They take and throw them in the tidal waters. Yes, idiots, paralytics, parasites go bobbing in the ebbing sewage nights out in the suburbs where there are no lights. If they do this to anyone who begs, drugged, drunk, or sober, with or without legs, what would they do to sick, four-legged dogs? In the cafes and on the sidewalk corners, the joke is going round that all the beggars who can afford them now wear life preservers. In your condition, you would not be able even to float, much less to dog paddle. Now look, the, prax the practical, the sensible solution is to wear a fantasia. Tonight, you simply can't afford to be a eyesore. But no one will ever see a dog in mascara this time of year. Ash Wednesday will come, but carnival is here. What sambas can you dance? What will you wear? They say the carnival is degenerating. Radios, Americans, or something have ruined it completely. They're just talking. Carnival is always wonderful. A depilated dog would not look well. Dress up. Dress up and dance at Carnival. So my uh, substantially shorter poem with the same title is about a dying dog with the same disease, a pink dog, that we saw on a murderously hot afternoon in the beautiful port city of Penang in Malaysia. And this poem is on page 50 of the book. Pink Dog. He's dying alone on the streets of Penang. I'm watching him cling to his last afternoon. I'm saying, in this heat, Today, he'll die. With no shade, nowhere to go, he'll pose for photos. This is the maximum love he's got left. No one will touch him. His fur is completely gone. He wears disease and sunburn. Shuffling at me for a stroke, he stops as I back off. Even the flies refuse his sores. He's six years dead, but I'm not rid of the pink dog of Penang and his drawn-out dying. He stands shivering away on my Malaccan rug. We've traded immortality and some deeper infection. He won't obey, though I beg Lie down in the shade, boy. Lie down. The next poem is a sonnet. A not quite Shakespearean sonnet, but a variation on one. It's one of three poems in the book that explore alternate realities based on Shakespeare plays. And it's a love poem based on the idea that Shakespeare's female characters are often smarter and wiser than their male characters, uh, and that women need to train men to be properly respectful and devoted lovers. And it's essentially a sonnet full, crammed full of Shakespearean names, the names of Shakespeare's characters, many of them strong women. The alternate Shakespeare universe comes in at the end of the poem when the male narrator declares that he is glad that his lover, represented by the fairy queen Titania, in A Midsummer Night's Dream, will always be in love with him because she is still mistakenly under the influence of a love potion, unlike in the play. Now, this may sound like a poem against free will in love, but actually Shakespeare's play makes the same point. And I'll illustrate this by reading, by beginning with two speeches from the end of A Midsummer Night's Dream, from Act 4, Scene 1. In the first speech, the lover Demetrius declares that he loves Helena, even though he has been pursuing her friend, Hermia, for most of the play. The beautiful thing about this speech is how genuine it is, even though at the end of the play, Demetrius is still under the influence of the love potion. Shakespeare doesn't tie up his loose ends. 
We can imagine that he lives the rest of his life happily married to Helena. Is this the result of being drugged, a chemical deception? Well, no. Rather, the love po potion is a symbol of the magic of love uh, and how love can both make people behave irrationally and also set them on the right path. So this is a short speech by Demetrius. My good Lord, I wot not by what power, but by some power it is, my love to Hermia, melted as the snow, seems to me now as the remembrance of an idle god, which in my childhood I did dote upon, and all the faith, the virtue of my heart, the object and the pleasure of mine eye is only Helena. To her, my lord, was I betrothed ere I saw Hermia, but like in sickness did I loathe this food. But as in health, come to my natural taste, now I do wish it, love it, long for it, and will forevermore be true to it. So still under the influence of the potion, of course. In the second speech, Bottom the Weaver awakens from his enchanted love affair with Titania. Oberon, the jealous fairy king, played a trick on Titania by ordering Puck to put a love potion on her eyes that made her fall in love with Bottom. Bottom, at the same time, as I'm sure you know, was given the head of a donkey, or ass, a roba. By Act 4 of the play, Titania has been cured of her accidental love for Bottom by an antidote. Bottom is transformed back into a human. When he awakens, he thinks the whole experience has been a dream. Now, this speech is written in prose, not poetry, because Bottom is a rude mechanical. He's a lower class character. But the prose has the beauty of poetry and the profound power of an average man attempting to express a transformative experience. For me, this confused speech has always been a symbol of the struggle to write honestly. A very confused speech, as you'll hear. Bottom, awaking. I should get John to read this out. I'm, I, I'll try not to do, do, do it. Um, I have had a most rare vision. I have had a dream past the wit of man to say what dream it was. Man is but an ass if he go about to expound this dream. Methought I was, there is no man can tell what, methought I was, methought I had, but man is a patched fool if he will offer to say what methought I had. The eye of man hath not heard, the ear of man hath not seen, man's hand is not able to taste, his tongue to conceive, nor his heart to report what my dream was. I will get Peter Quince to write a ballad of this dream. It shall be called Bottom's Dream, because it hath no bottom. So after that very long preamble, the sonnet from page 28 of the book, as he likes it, for Tina B. Kate seems a kitten when you're hot and fierce. Helena's bait and switch, Rosalind's guile, pale in comparison to your long game. You'd lift a ring from Portia while she riled the dinner guests with platitudes of justice. You're wild as Beatrice dressed in her disdain. But any other wife would be a shadow, the name and not the thing. Hermione's, Cordelia's, Desdemona's pieties bore you, you claim. But your Petruchio sees the deep lodestar, the love that terrifies, Titania with the potion on her eyes, and thanks his stars that he's a forest beast, safe now that Oberon's antidote is lost. <clears throat> Uh, 
I think there's barely enough time in human life to master even one art form. Uh, I chose poetry as my art form, or as with many poets, it chose me. But since moving to Japan in 2006, uh, I've had the fortune to become quite a serious photographer as well. Japan is a wonderful country to photograph, and we've traveled frequently in developing countries and come to understand how photojournalism can be quite a dangerous business. This next poem is one of two elegies to photographers in the book. Uh, it's an elegy to photographer and cameraman Simon Cumbers, and I'll just read the note from the end of the book to introduce this poem. Simon Cumbers, 1968 to 2004, was an Irish-born freelance journalist. Cumbers retrained as a cameraman in the 1990s. He was working for the BBC as Frank Gardner's cameraman when the two men were shot by Al-Qaeda sympathizers in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, Gardner survived, but Cumbers was killed. And finally, photographers often refer to the lenses they carry as their glass. And this is on page 48 of the book. Cameraman. A man feels better with something to hold in his own defense. Or better yet, something to point like a magic bone at enemies, at obsolescence, at anyone who would disagree. So better a weapon that can strike a man dead than this millstone of high technology with nothing but the power to go on the record. When they turn their guns on you, you don't have time to beg. And even if you had the time, you wouldn't, knowing what's at stake through all the years you've pulled focus on people ready to kill for belief, though you've turned the tables on them since you're the one closer to what it meant to be a prophet, steady-handed to the end, beaming the truth out over wireless as the murderers close in, keeping the frame tight, outlived only by the odds, and luckier colleagues who've limped through deserts, balanced on broken legs, walked backwards through Afghanistan with burned hands, or a bullet in the arse, and kept the camera rolling through riots, through falling bombs, white phosphorus. And so you went, weighed down only in body, let's say a saint, long martyred in the practice of carrying the kit of a modern alchemist, knowing what weight it takes to capture light and cut it without bias, knowing that medium and message both have mass, with all it took for them to take your life, strap your body in a black bag full of glass. Well, the next poem may be the lightest poem in the book, for change. Uh, <laughs> I write a lot about uh, gender and sexuality in Japan, and perhaps I think that uh, Western media, as you might think, often sensationalizes these aspects of Japanese society. Uh, however, I also think that many aspects of sexuality in Japanese culture are unique. Although I agree that most countries uh, still have gender issues, including Japan, I believe that there are many positive aspects of artistic and cultural sexual expression in Japan, and that these should be studied and celebrated by the rest of the world. This is the poem I was most hesitant about putting in the book. Uh, perhaps it's a bit safe in that the relationship is between a man and an inanimate object. But despite its light tone, I hope it addresses some serious issues, and I also hope that it is a feminist poem in that the satire in it is directed against the male gaze. The poem was inspired by an article in the Japanese news media, and it's on page 40 of the book. Love Doll Rental Agency, Shibuya. I press the gate buzzer and lower the tone of the handset hooking me up with the unknown. 
The courier drops off an unmarked crate. I lift her snakeskin body's featherweight to the light. Her arm drapes over my shoulder like a rubber boa. Off the heart lung pump, she's a plump guilt spree. Her lips and seals gleam with petroleum jelly. Compared to a tattoo's 10,000 punctures, the patches on her punctures seem demure. Two centuries after the patchwork monster's murders, this is the bride he could have custom ordered. Here's someone who will do, and did. She won't bat an eyelid. Her voice is motion, the squeak of the sibyl. Girls so gorgeous should wear name labels. Actually, her name's on the box, right above Graduate School of Hard Knocks. We spend a quarter of an hour getting to know each other over a glass of bubbly in the bath. She's such an easy person to be with. But wherever we are, I can somehow hear the sound of a silent counter counting down. When we've only got 20 minutes left, it dawns on me that she's playing hard to get. I twig that she said nothing for the whole hour, though somehow I hadn't noticed this before. A knock at the door. It's the courier. What weight is this she's slipping out from under? He offers to help her pack. I'm a wreck. We roll her into her bubble wrap kimono. My jaw locks in the O of, please don't go. The courier observes, you still look bored. She answers from the crate, it's not that hard. I'm going to read just one poem now that isn't in the collection. So there's, there's no uh, page number here. Uh, poets, as a rule, should not read unpublished work. Uh, but I hope you'll make an ex allow me to make an exception under these circumstances. Uh, Tina and I are cutting it quite fine in terms of the timing of this reading, since Tina's expecting our first child to arrive in the next few weeks, or possibly days. Um, so this is a very recent poem based on an expression that Tina came up with. And it may never see publication, I don't know. Meet Palace. At 29 weeks, you termed yourself the Meat Palace, a castle rented to a flexing triton, swimmer sleek, muscling himself up to fill his empire, your heartbeat teaching him the rhythms of his own hungry blood vessels, the epic meter of his future annals. He's as open-mouthed as a flower breathing rain, accustomed now to his submerged domain. Snug in your meat palace, you tease him, when the showerhead's hot patter thrubs the tuned timpani of your abdomen, a dim drum roll of thunderstorm delight, an underground concerto to his ears. He wriggles in pleasure like an octopus, jet squidding his dream swim through your circulation's mysteries, your blood warm southern seas. What implications for him, for us all, this unremembered sovereignty of the senses, founded in little more than a nutshell? No, it's not unremembered. Every girl's a princess, a kidnapped Persephone. And you, son, every man's a Tamburlaine, an insatiable killer on a bloody throne, pushing on slaughter after slaughter, though none of his conquests can ever recover. This deep sea divers hover on his first throne, where he's lord of an empire he'll never remember, where his breath lives in his scepter, a lifeline and a tether, carrying the rhythm in a rhythmic twist, a length of living rope clutched in his fist. Right, getting towards the end. Um, back, to, back to Japan. I've been translating uh, haiku and waka since we moved to Japan 
in 2006, but I wrote both of those forms uh, for a long time before that, uh, since university. An important moment for me was reading English poetry in Japanese forms before I could read Japanese. Uh, haikai, uh, haikai no renga, haiku, senryu, other forms, all written by the Irish poet Paul Muldoon. Not <coughs> translations, but original work. As a master of rhyme and form, Muldoon's haiku gave me a template for writing English poetry using Japanese form. Japanese poetry, of course, rarely uses rhyme, but rhyme in English poetry can convey the strictness and elegance of Japanese meter creating exciting rhymes in a very limited space of a haiku or tanka is a great challenge and I think it's an effective technique for conveying the precision and power of Japanese form in English. I'll read just a couple of Muldoon's haiku to give you a sense of what he does. Uh, just one or two from uh, his long sequence Hopewell Haiku which is about rural New, Jer New Jersey, the winter in rural New Jersey in America. And then I'll read a haikai, or a humorous haiku verse, from the collection. Here are a couple of examples of Muldoon's haiku. A stone at its core. This snowballs the porcelain knob on winter's door. Though cast in metal, our doorstop hair finds no place in which to settle. The finer the cloth in your obi or waist piece, the finer the moth. A small, hard pear falls and hits the deck with a thud. Ripeness is not all. So you can see, you know, haiku as he calls them, but sometimes closer to haikai or senryu, very humorous and about nature. He does include kigo or season words in his haiku and kireji, some, some the cutting sense, but often very light and often about society as well as nature. So this one is not about nature. I'll read haikai shoehorn, about the device, the shoehorn, on page 32 of the collection. Haikai, shoehorn, left foot. From home to home it lurked among the umbrellas to force one thing into another for want of a Cinderella. It was the civil tongue I couldn't keep, cut out, caned, and set in steel. Not a proud horn lost as the boot descended from the rhinoceros. But like cattle prod, named for its victim, to cram sachet into shod. Any shoe can fit if you take off your sock or whittle down your foot. But snug inside each pirouette and victory march lurks the curse of the ingrown nail the fallen arch. Right foot. Since things that don't fit have to seem to fit, a shoehorn's a useful heirloom to inherit. Each heel rides its slide into wingtip or Oxford or any tanned hide. Its chromed spoon reflects Every time I tie the knot, why I genuflect. Down in the round hole, square pegs must, when style demands, breathe out their parole. For form's sake we kneel to preserve the dark expanse between tongue and heel. Then standing what we can, and shooing what we can't accept, we sidestep the spot where our fathers fell in step. <clears throat> and I think I'll finish with reading what's hopefully a very simple poem about 
some of the themes that are the most important to me in verse. Animal life and the relationship between human beings and nature. So a final poem from Japan. This is on page 65 of the book. The Hawk at Kawa no Yu. This is a river hot spring bath in Japan. What do I know of the hawk, though I've looked him in the eye, where I've seen the gold-flecked soles of his old prey? Naked in a hot river, breathing its sulfates, I eye the hawk and become the hawk bait. Two meters above my boil and blanch, the golden hawk perches on a bare branch. In the Castalian spume of Kawa no Yu, he and I will divide the truth from the merely true. Like these falling leaves of red momiji, the upturned palms of a lover's plea, like this maple leaf with its red work done, falling through the steam's white occlusion. The hawk won't stoop to my nakedness with nothing to regret, nothing to confess. He sends no look, no sign, but a last red leaf falls between us. His honed self and my grief that even now I'm still in love with the hawk and maple, a love no leaf, no hawk can return or even feel, a truth that leaves me more full of love for the old lie, the anthropomorphic lie, than the truth in the hawk's eye. Thank you.